Hey friends, welcome to One Little Coder. In this week AI news, we have three main sections. The first one, we're going to talk about papers and LLM tools. The papers are mostly focused on LLM techniques and multimodal new models. The next section is going to be about AI watermarking. And then the final section is about general AI news that you have the crisp news for you to watch. First thing that we're going to discuss is mini GPT V2. There was a version one before. This is a multimodal model where you can upload an image and ask any question or do anything that you want. It's a large language model as a unified interface for visual language multitask learning. It's from King Abdullah University of Science and Technology and also Meta AI Research. The previous version, I don't know which model, I don't remember which model that used, but the latest one, it uses Llama 2 model for the language aspect and the VIT vision transformer model for the vision aspect of it. And you've got a lot of good demos here. For example, you've got this image and then it says, identify this and it says it's a black chain ring and you've got like a photo and then it says, which country does it come from? And it says Australia. And you can even have like individual elements in the same image and answer it. The most interesting thing for me from the, the mini GPT V2 is the, the benchmarks. If you see the benchmarks on a particular benchmark, like here, for example, you've got like multiple benchmarks, mini GPT V2 chart, 7 billion parameter model, the red color one, in fact, beats the lava model, the lava 13 billion parameter model, which we found to be really, really good open source multimodal model. The next one is called Limur. Limur is an open source model that is specifically designed for being an agent. So it's Limur harmonizing natural language and code for language agents. While most of the large language models are built with, you know, text generation or instruction following in mind, Limur has been created with agents in mind. Like they wanted to create this model so that this model can act as the back end or the backbone of agents. And they have, they have introduced two models, Lemur and Lemur chart. And you can see some of the benchmarks that they've got. The good thing with Lemur is the model is also available on Hugging Face Modeler. Overall, I think this is a very interesting space. Uh, like I said, the first news, multimodal, multimodality, multimodal open source model is one space that is quite interesting. The second one is the agent space. Having dedicated large language models, especially the open source ones, focused on uh, agent is actually a good thing and that is Lemur for you to check it out. Next one is actually a very interesting model. This is uh, now trying to combine the agent space and the multimodality space. It's called Octopus. It says embodied vision, vision language programmer for environmental feedback. But when you watch their demo, you would actually see that it is a model that, uh, that itself can plan things that can play GTA Vice City. Um, I don't know which version of GTA, like I'm not, I'm not uh, into gaming these days, at least like for the last many years, but you can see that it has got a task goal and uh, based on that, the agent co comes up with a plan. It says, okay, walk to the state. The state is like, you know, the action walk to the dog and then the, the human or whatever the NPC or the playing character here actually went to the dog and then it uh, says, okay, bring the dog to the car, get on the car with the dog and it gets the dog to the car. So as you can see here, this is completely done by Octopus. Uh, I'm definitely quite interested in uh, trying out this model in, in itself. But as you, if you see this, this is like combining the best of the both worlds, like whatever we saw that uh, one is your multi-model model and the second one is your agent architecture where this model Octopus uh, can, um, can help you design things that can go much beyond what we do with the regular model in itself. It's a very interesting aspect. And one more interesting aspect uh, as part of Octopus is something that they call RLEF. So we have seen RLHF, reinforcement learning from human feedback. We have seen RLAIF, reinforcement learning from AI feedback. The one that they are describing here is reinforcement learning with environmental feedback. So what they're trying to do with Octopus is they're trying to have Octopus improve based on the environmental feedback. The next one is called a project called audio sip. And also it comes with a paper called separate anything you describe separate anything you describe takes natural language from human beings and it tries to segment that particular piece from any audio track. For example, you've got an audio track and then you say that I want the dog voice from it. The separate anything you describe can actually get that for you just using natural language. For example, if you have got an audio track like this, let's say this, you have got a normal audio track and then you just give a query that you want dog and it can exactly extract dog for you and give you the result. Or you can just say, I want the sound of acoustic guitar 
and it can separate it for you and give it to you. So you don't have to like use Audacity or any kind of tool to actually separately get it. Rather, you just have to give natural language query and then it can get it for you. And um, this paper also, this is an implementation of audio SIP, which is a foundation model for open domain sound separation with natural language queries. It's uh, it has according to them, it has got like impressive zero shot generation ability. That means out of the box, you can literally use the model and then do a lot of these uh, audio separations, not just audio separation. It can also do musical instrument separation, which is something that a lot of people usually try to do. Like, can I extract just vocals from a track? Can I just extract drums from a track? This is something that a lot of people usually try to do when, when it comes to sound mixing, audio mixing, it seems like this model audio sip can do it out of the box and also speech enhancement. Yeah, they've got like a demo page. Uh, you can definitely go try it out, but it is another interesting aspect from a different multimodal world where you've got text and audio in the same space that can help you get um, audio clips or a part of an audio track just simply using text. The next one is a paper called adapting LLM agents through communication. LTC, LTC stands for learning through communication. So we have learned that how, was, how, how how do people train a large language model? They have like a pre-trained model. There's like raw data. The raw data goes through the training process. You build a pre-trained model. Then the model sometimes go through a supervised fine tuning process, something called an SFT. Sometimes that the, the SFT model further goes through something called RLHF, reinforcement learning from human feedback. And we recently saw on another paper which has reinforcement learning from environment feedback. On a very similar line, what this paper from Microsoft actually says is, and also from Georgia Institute of Technology, it says that we they are introducing a new concept called learning through communication. It's a novel training approach for enabling LLM agents to improve continuously through interactions with their environments and other agents. This is very similar like RLEF, just like I mentioned before. So what they are saying is that to optimize the agent interaction for task specific learning, they are introducing three communication patterns. One is monologue, the second one is a dialogue, and the third one is an analog. So in, in a monologue, in a, in a monologue communication, the agent talks in like a self talk style and get feedback from the environment. In the dialogue setup or in the dialogue communication, the agent talks to other agents and get feedback. And in an analog facility, the agent tries to learn through a teacher agent that is available. So learn from environment, learn from fellow agents and learn from a teacher agent and also you know, get feedback from the teacher agent instead of environment. So this is like the three communication patterns that they've exp explored in this particular concept called learning through communication. And as you can see, what they're trying to say is typically if you have a large language model and if you want model to do good, you usually fall back with ICL. ICL stands for in context learning. But what they're saying is when you do in context learning, you your inference is not very efficient because you stuff a lot of things into prompts and it's always example dependent. You have to give few short examples and then you have to learn from that. What they're saying instead, if you do ITLTC, learning through communication is, so your prompt, you know, it's, it's a, you, you don't care about prompting. There is efficient inference and also continuous learning. I didn't get into the details of how exactly they have managed to do it. But if you want to take away something from this particular paper that they are trying to make this agents, this large language model based agents, learn continuously through this process of dialogues or monologue or also you know analog and ultimately they have compared this with certain um, certain benchmarks that they have found and they have figured out that the model that they have got beats a lot of other models in different benchmarks this is ultimately is also a bit of reinforcement learning but ultimately if you see this is a new approach and this approach is scoring better on certain data, data sets like ALF world, which is a decision making data set, hot pot QA, which is a knowledge intensive reasoning data set and GSM 8K. We all know this is like the general math that we have been seeing. And uh, they're saying that a uh, Lama 7 billion agent has uh, scored like better than, you know, like the other models in that. And they've also compared with other models, like other language models. And they've said, this seems like the LTC approach can uh, be versatile and be expanded to like other formats as well. So this is this is a very interesting approach. I think a lot of people are trying to get over with RLHF and then find other ways to make large language models or agents learn efficiently 
from the environment like from the get go this is one another approach that is called ltc learning through communication and the paper is adapting llm agents through communication next one is another interesting paper whatever deep learning happens in the world cycle stuff and one of the stuff is time series forecasting you always need to predict what is going to be tomorrow's weather you always need to predict when like a storm is going to come you always need to predict what is your demand paper that's called i transformer explores a concept of how you can invert the transformers and that can be used for a time series forecasting this is once again another paper from chinese universities and you know the the gist of it is you have transformer based models and how can you use transformer based model that simply inverts the duties of attention mechanism and the feed forward network so a transformer models main important aspect is the attention mechanism that kind of tries to link different different token what i transformer is trying to do here is trying to invert what a typical transformer model would do in case of text generation and then use that for time series forecasting it's a very interesting paper that's more like a survey paper it it explores the abilities of large language models or how the abilities of large language models are affected by sft supervised fine tuning data composition so when you do supervised fine tuning you have got like set of data that data is very crucial for you to do supervised fine tuning so this paper is exploring how that particular um, fine tuning data or data composition and also techniques make the abilities or decide or steer the abilities of large language models this is once again a paper from china this is from alibaba inc who's been releasing a lot of models like good models like quen quen vl quen vl chat and uh, basically what they are trying to figure out is they are trying to figure out okay how does the performance of a large language model change based on different ways of supervised fine tuning sft the four methods that they four training strategies that they explored in this paper is multitask learning sequential learning mixed sequential training and uh, dual stage mixed fine tuning is what they are proposing it's a dmt as part of dual stage multi mixed fine tuning dmt what they are saying is we are going to first make the model learn specialized abilities and then they are going to let the model learn general abilities with small amount of data it's again a very interesting aspect to see how do we take this base model and then make the model learn better and uh, all these illustrations that you see here it is all around the same concept about how to make the model learn more like have more coverage but also not compromise on specific abilities that it might have and that is what this paper is exploring which is looking at the abilities of large language models especially from the sft supervised fine tuning data set composition and it also goes into the details of the the uh, the techniques how the model is being trained this one is super interesting it's called mpt sparse fine tuned on gsm 8k with deep sparse it it comes with a concept called sparse fine tuned llm with deep sparse so typically you know that if you want to run a large language model you need gpu gpu why gpu because gpu offers accelerated computing accelerated computing is important for you to do matrix multiplication which is like fundamentally what deep learning is about and you know that cuda is um, uh, nvidia's proprietary software and pytorch is like has got pytorch as framework has got like optimization for cuda so ultimately you need nvidia gpus for you to do deep learning and in turn large language models what this new concept called uh, deep sparse especially sparse fine tuned llms with the deep sparse is trying to do is it's trying to understand and it is also implementing how do you run large language models on cpus not gpus you don't need gpus at all you don't need nvidia gpu you don't need amd gpus all it is trying to do is how do you run these models on cpus and if you see their research what they have done is they have taken the mpt 7 billion which is a model from mosaic ml the 7 billion parameter model they have pruned the model to 60% sparsity with int8 quantization and uh, the 70% sparsity without quantization so this is with quantization this is without quantization with no accuracy drop like there was no accuracy drop using a technique called sparse fine tuning uh, where we prune the network during the fine tuning process the network they mean is like the neural networks while running the pruned network with deep sparse we can accelerate the inference by 7 times over the dense fp2 the floating point 32 maybe the 7 times is the little um, on the stretcher part because they are comparing it with the fp32 uh, base but ultimately if you see 
this is a very good approach like i think a lot of things that we do on this channel is to see how can you run large language models on local machines especially we have explored concepts of ggf ggml models with like all these quantization concepts are trying to make these models run on consumer hardware and this is like one aspect where you can run the the deep sparse model on consumer hardware if you go to the hugging face spaces you can see this is running on a cpu upgrade i'm not sure what is like the the ram of this model what is the memory of this model but you can see like in the model's accuracy has not dropped but the model has been sped up and this is what this chart is actually saying this is sparse fp32 this is sparse int18 int8 integer 8 and this is the baseline only when you go to the ultimate speed up you can see the the accuracy dropping um, but otherwise you can see even with with such a speed up like almost closer to 7 you can see that there is no speed dropping and like for example you can go here and then try as well like you can click this send this and this is um, this is happening in like real time like you can see it started generating the token on cpu not gpu on cpu and they have taken the mpt model and tried it it's from a company called neural magic which i've seen multiple times before and i've seen i think their ceo also talking about how you know these models can be optimized but i never got deeper into it maybe the, like this is this is the hook for me to try this further let me know in the comment section what do you feel about this kind of initiatives i'm still quite perplexed to see that there is not a lot of initiatives to create something like cuda that would uh, that would make it easier for uh, for people to run things on like let's say amd processor or any other gpus or even for that matter like cpus i know like if you see cpus quantization is the only thing that people are doing i think researches like this um, optimizations other than quantization should also you know take place to help these large language models run on consumer hardware like even edge devices i think that would be like a really good welcome research let's see what is going to happen but at least now you have got mpt sparse fine tuned on uh, gsm 8k with the math data set with deep sparse that can run accelerated inference on cpus not gpu just on cpus next one is a very interesting paper and is especially if you're coming from the classical ml world i, I guess like you would uh, love this the paper's name is called the geometry of truth emergent linear structure in large language model presentations of true and false data set okay so what these researchers have done is they have prepared a data set which has got true items and false items true items false items true items false items this is the data set and they have built a large language model based on that and when they took one particular layer layer 12 the residual stream and they present uh, they created the representation of that and they used pca pca stands for principal component analysis it's one of the dimensionality reduction techniques imagine like you have got 200 columns 200 columns in a data set sometimes you don't want to represent 200 columns so you would use pca principal component analysis to build smaller components that would necessarily represent this large columns without much of a loss and that's what they've done when they did it what they figured out is that there is a clear linear separation you can see here there is a clear linear separation the the blue color is true the uh, the red color is false so for true I, true and false you can see a clear linear separation in the representation of the large language model so somehow inherently when these large language models learn they have they have created this linear separation based on which they actually created a classifier so one the large language model has this clear linear separation so you can very well see true and false being separated for most of the data sets except you know the last one and what they've done is they've actually created a classifier that learned from this and then can differentiate between true and false and they figured out that this can generalize really well it's a very interesting paper to be honest i think the fundamental philosophy of this paper is how can we make sure that this large language models always tell us truth how can we make sure it complies instructions well i think uh, that's that's been a fundamental problem of large language models if you ask me they hallucinate a lot sometimes they'll convince you that this is real when even when it is not real so this paper looks at a very interesting aspect goes into the layers of the llama 13 billion parameter model and uh, tries to understand how these uh, true and false are represented in those layers and it has a very clear linear distinction and that's why in fact like the model is uh, the paper is called the geometry of truth because it's like a linear separation a linear structure in the large language models of separating true and false very interesting paper for you to check it out the next one is a text to video generation model it's called show one 
marrying pixel and latent diffusion models for text to two video generation and you've got like multiple demos here like for example a beautiful fluffy domestic hen sitting on white eggs in a brown nest eggs are under the hen and you can see the details here and you can not just that they created this here but they also have uh, made it that it is highly efficient for example uh, compared to visual VDMs, show one is much more efficient the gpu memory usage during inference is 15 gig versus 7 I shared the entire code for you to run it and you can just go ahead and then start using it i think this is another very interesting space we have got like proprietary good proprietary models like runway ml pixel labs all these are like it can take text and then create videos but um, i think open source also has like good potential we have got one more new coding model from Repilit. Repilit already had this model. This is the latest version of the same model. And the model is available on Hugging Face Model Hub. So this is a programming model. Like it can help you for coding as it can act as a coding assistant for you. Uh, the good thing with this model is this is a smaller model. So you can see that this is a 3 billion parameter model. And if you see the benchmarks and uh, in evaluation pass one, you can see that this model is somewhere between the star code a 3 billion parameter model and code lama 7 billion parameter model this being a 3 billion parameter model it is closer to the code lama 7 billion parameter model on the past two, the evaluation of the past two you can see this model is doing much much better than the code lama 7 billion parameter model appellate code version 1.5 3 billion parameter model that does better than code lama and pass to the multi multi mle mle evaluation pass to it does better this one is you, you all know that we covered a model called zephyr uh, i was pronouncing it zephyr uh, during that video a lot of you corrected me saying it is zephyr i hope i'm pronouncing it correct zephyr so zephyr is a model that uh, got released from hugging face team where they instead of using rlhf for any kind of alignment they used a new technique for alignment which is again like like kind of a reinforcement learning based technique it's called dpo but that model was not like completely permissively licensed when we covered on the channel. But uh, thanks to a bunch of nice conversation, that model is now MIT licensed. It started from a hugging face community. Thread. I just wanted to cover this one primary aspect because it, it was one of those moments like where you read like an internet thread and then you feel really happy about a lot of good things happening despite a lot of bad things happening in the world. So I just wanted to cover this one. Zephyr is MIT licensed at this point. But also it was quite warm to see collaboration in the AI community, especially just on an, like an internet forum where anybody could be anonymous. And this is about two different models from Eric Hartford. We already covered one of the models on this channel. Dolphin 2.1, which is a Mistral fine-tuned model. And also Eric has another model, which is called Samantha. This is a model that a lot of people um, have spoken about. Like we did not cover this model previously on this channel. But if you ever want to build like a friend, uh, like a partner uh, based AI solution, Samantha is a really good model for that. And um, yeah, it's been trained on philosophy, psychology, personal relationship. And it's kind of like inspired uh, by the name movie Her. Uh, she will not engage on any of these things. But again, like Samantha is like, a, like, for example, if you want to build a startup, like a product where, uh, you know, old people could talk to AI and get like a good response if if uh, they don't have anybody else to talk i think this is like one of those models that you can probably build and then give it to them so samantha is one model and like i said the other model is dolphin which we already covered on this channel definitely check it out i think people like eric hartford technium they make our lives very easy with all these models just uh, pumping in these models that we ultimately end up using or choosing to use whenever we want for whatever need it is so samantha and dolphin are based on Mistral 7 billion parameter model. Next, Mistral 7 billion fine tuned model is called Arithmo. It has been created by Ashwini Kumar Jindal. So, what this model is trying to do is this model is trying to make Mistral 7 billion parameter model better on math. Uh, the, the most interesting aspect for me, at least for uh, on this model, is uh, it has been trained on QLORA, which is okay, but on a single RTX 4090. So, this is like somebody like us on a consumer hardware trained this model. Um, I'm not sure if I should call 4090 as consumer hardware. I'm not, I'm not sure, but anyways, it has been trained on a single RTX 4090 GPU. The model is tuned to reason and answer mathematical problems. And you can go here and then see how the model is doing. It has got some uh, pretty good responses. There are not a lot of benchmark results at this point, at least here, but this model is something that um, 
shows promising aspect that you can take Mistral 7 billion parameter model. Even with QLoRa, you can fine tune the model for like certain domain specific aspects and the model would ultimately end up doing good. And um, this is like a living proof for us to use that. So this is Arithmo Mistral 7 billion parameter model from Ashwini Kumar Jindal. Next one is a very interesting technique. Definitely I want to make a separate video about it. It's called attention sinks. So typically what happens is when you have a large language model, uh, when you even on Google Colab, when you chat with these models, after a particular point, it starts accumulating that memory. And after a particular point, it starts crashing. And this is what this chart says. So this model shows the RAM, VRAM usage. And as you can see, as you start chatting after a particular input sequence length, it hits more than 15 gigs. Google, Google uh, Colab is going to crash. That is one thing. The second thing is the log perplexity. So after a particular point, these models are going to like throw out complete gibberish, like random stuff you will not understand. It will show these kind of numbers and whatever it is. So two problems. One, it is going to throw gibberish. Um, perplexity is used to maintain what kind of random text the model is generating. And the second one is the VRAM usage. So VRAM usage and the loss of fluency. What this technique, Attention Sinks, is trying to do is trying to overcome these two techniques for all the existing models. In fact, it just takes two lines of code. Um, the code is like pretty straightforward. Somebody has somebody, this person, um, Tom Arsen has already created this model or this library, Python library, which you can just directly import and then start using it just like how you use transformers. I definitely want to make like a separate video, but in case like before that, if you want to explore this, this is something that you should explore. This is also based on a very interesting concept. Like a lot of people have been talking about is like the sliding window attention concept that Mr. Lee introduced. So it, it's not exactly the same, but it talks about a new concept called attention sinks and how it impacts the window attention and how, you know, you can manage memory, even when you cross the 4,000 token or 10,000 token, still how to make the model keep sane and how to keep the memory usage low. Definitely check it out. Attention sinks. The last one in the LLM or open source series is agent protocol. Uh, it's a group. I think it's creating like, it's trying to create like a standard protocol for AI agent communication. Uh, I'm positive about it and I'm also skeptical about it. You can go read more about it in the docs or you can go to agentprotocol.ai and what they're trying to say is they're trying to say they're creating like a single com common interface for agents to communicate. See, typically with these kind of protocols, um, if everybody accepts it, everybody adopts it, then it is a success uh, because m m mass adoption is very important. But if only, you know, randomly one or two people are uh, using it, nobody else is using it. These kind of protocols do not make sense. Now, welcome to the AI watermarking section. In this case, in this, we are going to first discuss the Meta AI's new watermarking technique called stable signature. This is a new method that Meta AI has developed to watermark images created using open, open source generative AI solutions. It's uh, it's not very difficult to use as you can see, like it's just like one line of code and with that one line of code, you can actually create the signature and uh, with that you'll be able to detect which is which one is AI generated picture or not. I don't know how many of you know the recent controversy. There is a, uh, there is a series on uh, Disney Plus or if you are in India, Hotstar called Loki. Loki is, um, is a Marvel superhero, anti-villain, um, something like that. So Loki was a successful uh, first series, the second series came. In one of the Loki posters, people are claiming that Loki poster has been using AI generated image from Shutterstock. So the concern is two things. One, did Shutterstock allow an AI generated image to be on Shutterstock? Did Loki graphic designers end up using AI generated image? It's a separate controversy, not worth talking about. But the problem here is, I, 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 didn't, I didn't mean it in a bad way. Like I'm not an expert in that area. So that's why I said not worth talking about. If you're a graphic designer, an artist who makes living out of it, maybe it's, it's, it's important for you not for me at least at this point. So now um, if you have this kind of AI watermarking techniques, you would be able to detect if that image is created using generative AI solutions. And that is exactly why Meta AI has put out this paper and uh, they have created this technology and how they are also d talking about, okay, if, if you have got a model, even if you do fine tuning, how does it work? And they've explored it with techniques like dream booth, uh, textual inversion and uh, other techniques like control it to see how it holds up. I've not gone into specific details exactly like how this model is working, but at the end of the day, it's like a watermark that is invisible for a um, stable signature to detect if that image is AI generated or not. The same line, Adobe recently announced that they have come up with a new concept called content credentials. 
what is this concept this concept says like if you have used any image ai image creator to create an image so it is going to give content credentials so for example microsoft announced introduce content credentials to all ai generated images uh, with bing image creator and uh, adobe is kind of doing the same thing especially adobe being in the stock photography or uh, image generation space uh, they are trying to um, take this up seriously very similar like what meta is doing in the open source world adobe is doing it in their world they have launched a website called contentcredentials.org and uh, if you use adobe's own tool like firefly or uh, if you if you happen to take any of this ai generated image you get to actually see the content credentials okay who created that image um, like from where it is being created the origin so it says this image combines the details the ingredients of the image uh, basically at the end of the day if you want to give credits you would be able to give credits anyways this is again a very interesting space i'm uh, definitely looking forward to see how this space is going to move especially because this space will have a lot of implications in the text world and um, when the text world started uh, um, improving like the large language model world one of the things that people always wondered is how the copywriting is going to work in the ai world it seems like companies like adobe or even meta they are figuring out ways to keep copyright working even in this age is it good is it bad i don't have an answer i'm not like a, i'm not a, i'm not a copyright expert but i'm just curious to see how this might inhibit innovation or there is no trade off between innovation versus copyright at the end of the day let me know in the comment section what do you feel about this ai watermarking tools there are initiatives there have been initiatives to watermark llm text previously so this will be very interesting to see how this space is going to transition into the text space the next set of sections is simply going to be general news nothing specific funding and all these things the first one in that even though it is not very specifically related to ai it's a contest that was created by nat friedman and you can see that the first word discovered in unopened herculaneum scroll by 21 year old computer science student in um, two millennia i think it's it's like uh, for 2000 years nobody had read anything so the very interesting aspect is that people have found out some scrolls that were like uh, that that got that was in a library that uh, got affected by volcanic eruption i guess and uh, with these scrolls were like always preserved like this there have been a lot of scans and all these kind of things but nobody would ever try to open it because they knew that if you open it these scrolls will become dust uh, or would become dust so what they are trying to always do is how can i read the text inside these scrolls without opening the scroll it's a very interesting problem statement even nat friedman uh, discussed this in one of the podcast so what has happened here is that in a very short space if you see that uh, like like the title says a 21 year old computer science student had cracked so they have identified these characters these letters these are like greek letters and uh, i think this translates into like a uh, purple and uh, following that the first person luke farter the second person in this case is yusuf nader who managed to do the same discovery in the same area you can see like it's the same area so it's it's this is the first person submission and this is the second person submission you can see like in the same area they have figured out so went to the kaggle competition called ink detection follow prize picked one of the solutions and then tried it adapted it for uh, scrolls and then used that and then fine tuned it for fragment labels and then found some success i think it's a very um, it's a very interesting way to approach a problem to say that you know not every solution requires like completely mind blowingly new or innovative solution you can always like bring in different things from different sites and then probably like come up with a solution and uh, this is this is exactly and use of solution is in fact available on github for you to use it uh, it says vesuvius first letters and you can go ahead and then read the details about it what kind of transformations they did and all the details are available here for you to use it definitely very um, very interesting challenge i think the overall price money is about $700000 grand prize and the i think the first prize winner got $40000 the second prize winner got $10000 and i think all of them are uh, based on um, one more person who created like the baseline image uh, um, you know brightness for them so that person also got a $10000 um first time in 2000 years looks very interesting so if you are one of those um, you know crazy minded uh, like a, like a lunatic a programmer who is interested in image processing definitely you should try it out you remember a couple of weeks back we covered a news called human human comes with like a pin that i think you can keep it on the shoulder it's an ai company but hardware ai company that has 
like a, like an iPhone like a device. Recently, got to know that Sam Altman is the biggest investor or biggest stakeholder in human through um, various holding companies. Uh, it it came to know that Sam Altman holds. Uh, almost closer to 15% equity and also the voting through number of holding companies. Once again, Sam Altman is back in our news. Uh, this time, OpenAI revenue skyrockets to 1.3 billion annualized revenue rate. This is more than 30% from the last summer. Definitely, OpenAI seems to be going on a good track. Um, I would love to see the rise of fine-tuned or uh, local models and uh, how OpenAI would do it. Uh, this is something that I've been always saying. I wanted to see like Nvidia stock growth and also like quantization techniques and um, other techniques that lets you run fine tuned models on your local machine. I didn't see Nvidia stock going down at all even when we had Llama CPP and other techniques. Let's see how OpenAI is going to do in terms of revenue, especially with the growth of open source models. Final news with which I want to close today's news, AI news is GitHub Copilot is officially a hundred million dollar ARR product. It's a Chrome extension. I, it is $100 million ARR. It's quite surprising for me to see um, that uh, they are a $100 million ARR product only coding. It's not even like chat GPT. It's not like it can do vision or anything. It's just like a coding assistant. I think that's where like companies like Cursor and other AI um, based coding assistant companies are still existing in the marketplace because this is going to be a bigger pie. And uh, I think they claimed this in the recent AI engineer summit saying that it's a $100 million business. I'm definitely looking forward to see how this this is going to play out. People think that this is um, uh, this is like an anti statement for what they call as AI is a fad. But I guess uh, this ultimately comes back to again like how long this company can have their moat, how long they can stay up in the same place where they are staying. I recently came across a couple of techniques where you can run a local server connected to a Visual Studio Code extension and then use it. But anyways. I hope this uh, series of AI news was helpful to you. Uh, we have segmentized it. If you have any feedback, please let me know in the comment section. Otherwise, see you in another video. Happy prompting.